as they say that once there is a book of sanjay ghosh where he says how rongo lost his oak we thought why not we can lose the uh, visibility for some time because they say that the essence lies in the flavor where you moving around and as i was talking around that sanjay ghosh sanjay ghosh uh, carries his own reputation with the wit not only in the court but outside the court and they say a lawyer who can carry things in a lighter way not only lessen the stresses of himself the court room as well as all those persons who are watching that but be that as it may his book as we all know is doing extremely well we will ask if he has that book he can share that cover of that book definitely we will be sharing the link of that book in our whatsapp groups as well as on the telegram group so that those who know him already know him but those who will hear him today i am quite sacrosanct to the effect that they would love that why not instead of virtually hearing him why not have the taste of that book physically and give a mental stimulus to that entire events and when we are talking of in the challenges insights into the world of litigation we thought there could be a better person like sujoy ghosh who can give the insights into the world of litigation there are challenges i must say and when i was reading on the scc online his entire book discusses about that aspects the book we have all read is doing well it gives us what are the challenges what are the ups and downs as we all know that in the profession not only in the law but in other fields it's definitely a challenge but as they say when the going gets tough the tough gets going and that's the key what joy told me is the take to carry things forward and being a weekend bothering him when he was at his hometown but once they say that you have a knowledgeful person you can't control his knowledge to be controlled in a it's just like a bottle of perfume once you open it the aroma has to spread and despite being in calcutta we thought why not catch up with him over to you sanjay thank you vikas for having me i hope uh, we can at one stage make it more interactive and i'll be most happy to en- entertain questions from everyone but i'm a Uh, am i audible that's the most important question which was asked during the pandemic uh, through vcs and courts my lord am i audible so <laughs> actually we are not addressing the my lords it's audible <laughs> so let me start by first exposing vikas a little bit or rather defending him it is both an expose exposure of vikas and a defense of vikas poor vikas was very serious about putting some serious stuff for you guys and he came and we sat together and we tried to think our heads through through various serious topics ranging from the social security code to the uniform civil code and ultimately i told him vikas i'm on vacation and let's come up with something which is easy and which does not require too much preparation so that's how we came up with this rather all expansive <laughs> topic which is insights into litigation which means nothing so those who have logged in thinking that you will get the five steps to success well you uh, may be disappointed a because uh, you know uh, there are no five steps to success in litigation and there are no insights except as they say practice and practice which only you will have to experience and uh, as a matter of fact the first thing which i always feel is that there is so much of space in the litigation world for everyone you know we can talk about uh, how restrictive litigation is uncle judges uh, sons and do- daughters of judges and lawyers and those I- entry uh, difficulties but ultimately if you are competent if you are hard working and if you are determined to make make your life you know your own formula and you have your own insights you ca- i can't pretend to sit here in one hour and give you you know this the formula five point uh, rule etc so i can tell you in advance that you will be disappointed and frankly i have been accused of over promotion of my book vikas so i'm not here to promote to promote my book either which is why i don't even have a copy to flash on the screen uh but uh let me say that uh, i i'm very happy to uh, have you invite me because it's a vacation time and we are all more relaxed and uh, it is it is difficult in uh, it is difficult it has been a difficult two years during the pandemic i am told that i am told that seniors 
have uh, have have really made uh, it easy. Um, uh, the pandemic has been very good for seniors to travel all the way from London uh, to uh, to Delhi to uh, Rajasthan to uh, uh, to uh, the trial court to the Supreme Court uh, everywhere and. Uh, a certain section of people have made a lot of money, has become uh, very convenient, but uh, so far as uh, uh, so far as uh, a, a, another section of people are concerned, they have they have really really suffered during the uh, the pandemic, especially the young lawyers, especially um, uh, those lawyers who have just come into practice or who have just become independent. So. Uh, as we are opening up, it is, is it is a challenge for many to uh, you know get into uh, uh, the groove, uh, so as to say. So uh, now, you know, this is the only thing which I would say, and this is an advice I have for a lot of young students, a young law students, and young lawyers. And maybe this is a sign of age, but you must have patience, you know. One thing is that in litigation, as I said, and I'm repeating myself, that you can't have a chicken soup for the soul kind of series. You can't have, uh, you can't have a ready-made instant Maggi kind of solution. So therefore, it is only through the dint of hard work, and that means, and that means you'll have to, uh, you know, labor on, slog on, not expect instant results because it is a very slow moving profession and therefore you know i have seen so many so many young law students young lawyers reach out to me and and they are changing their their job for the you know if you can call it a job whatever they're changing their engagement three four times in one year because they already feel that oh i've been in a trial court and i've learned everything in three months now i want to be in a high court and i want to learn everything in the next Enjoy one minute because somehow there was uh, we had allowed unmute to everyone so sometimes there was a glitch so i am muting everyone yes, yes. then you you unmute yourself in a minute yeah Yeah, you can do that. Sanjoy, you can do, unmute yourself. Yes. So, as I was saying, uh, uh, as as I was saying that, uh, uh, so you know, like for example, young law, uh, young uh, young lawyers are um, are coming into the profession, and within six months, they are wanting to. Uh, change uh, their jobs and they feel that they have learned everything what they have to learn and that is not something which i would recommend that you do um, it is uh, just give me a minute just give me a minute please Yes, am I audible now? Okay, so therefore, so therefore, you know what I would advise is that you have some kind of patience and you'll have to give yourself that time to be able to, to, to learn everything. A lot, of, a lot of learning happens even sitting in court, waiting for the others, uh, waiting for your case and listening to other people. So a lot of young lawyers, 
find the proceedings a little hard. And I know during pandemic, it's even become difficult because you don't want crowded, uh, crowded courtrooms. So people tend to come out of the courtroom and they, they tend to talk with their colleagues. They tend to go to the canteen. Of course, canteen is very important, especially the Delhi High Court canteen and the Chandigarh High Court canteen have acquired iconic status. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is important to be inside court, watch how the, uh, how, the, uh, how the judge reacts, learn how lawyers who are senior to you tackle difficult situations. And these are, these are learnings which you will not get in law school. I mean, there is no kind of practical uh, kunji or some kind of textbook which is going to be uh, teaching you all this, okay? So this is very important to observe, very important to, uh, to go through the whole grind, so as to say. That's one. The other is, and this is very important, I would feel that please stop comparing. Because if you start comparing, you will be in difficulty. Okay, now everyone knows that there is a Mukul Rodgi and there is a Hari Salvi. I'm naming them by names because Dr. Singhvi, they are, they are legends of the bar. But everyone can't be that. And you should be aspiring. Be, don't aspire to be a Mukul Rodgi or a Hari Salve or a Singhvi or a Shonjoy or a Vikas or anyone. You aspire to be yourself. You are unique and you have to cultivate that uniqueness in you. So therefore, if you start comparing, especially with your classmates, okay, my classmate is in litigation, is in corporate sector, he or she is earning this much and look at me, or oh, my, my classmate is the son of a judge and he's getting these panels and I'm not getting this, it is only going to cause you a lot of heartburn. So that is not something which you should be doing. Focus on yourself, focus on your growth path, focus on your unique talents. If you feel that you are good in mediation, in alternate dispute resolution, then focus on that. Everyone does not have to be an arguing counsel. If you feel your, your forte is, is documentation, drafting, then focus on that. If you feel that you're a good you're good at arguments or good at research, so focus on that. So, you know, that is, of course, this is my advice to the young lawyers, I mean, not to those who are already established. So this is very important. And I have, all, and I have benefited, especially from, you know, lawyering is actually a psychological science. Not many people understand that because it is, we lawyers tend, tend to be good psychologists. And in fact, you know, I have done a lot of matrimonial work. And in India, we have a woeful lack of matrimonial counselors. And lawyers willy-nilly, and, and it's dangerous, I understand, but law, lawyers willy-nilly end up also being counselors. Um, so, and over time, you, 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 you pick up that skill, which is also important because you are constantly judging or psychologically analyzing the person in front of you. So you have to, in, in the courtroom, be analyzing the opponent, analyzing the judge. Often, if you are practicing the same forum, you, you, you already acquire that knowledge database, right? Because that is already there. But if you're, for example, going to a new court, I recently went to Chandigarh and I did not practice what I am telling you right now. Uh, instead of sitting in the court of, the, of that judge concerned, I went with my local instructing council and we went and had chai in the canteen and I suffered because of that. I should have rather been in court and observed the judge because I, it was a new judge for me, it's a new court for me and see how he reacts, what is his uh, or her approach to an injunction, to a claim of a worker or a management or to an adjournment. So these are very important uh, things which you pick up only by actually seeing what is happening. Uh, uh, well, uh, the other thing which I you know, want to say and, and, and address this elephant in the room, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, hard burn about the national law universities and now we have a lot of national law universities and a lot of the products. You know, when I went to law school in 1996, uh, and you know, because my book is a little semi-autobiographical, which you know, it doesn't take a lot of rocket science to figure that out. So the character Gorango also is almost, you know, coincidentally at the same time going to law school. And when he's going to law school, as I went to law school, uh, the National Law School, Bangalore, uh, people never had heard of law as a profession where actually people went all the way to South of India to study. You know, if you couldn't get in anywhere, the law was like the, the last option and uh, you would do it in the local law school. But now, of course, it's very competitive. 
and you have already a body of alumni and you have a body of network of, of national, law, national law university students or graduates. And there is a feeling that, there, uh, that firms prefer or top lawyers prefer to, uh, to engage such uh, people, graduates of NLUs. Now, I'm not going to pretend that that is not true. It is true because of obviously because now NCLAT and all are so competitive that you have you know lakhs of, of people who give this exam and only the creme de la creme gets selected. So obviously there is a presumption that these students are the smartest of their contemporaries. So obviously, and there is of course this alumni preference, but it is important like you are you are setting up this network of CLC students, so beyond CLC. So it is important to build a solidarity base. And like whether the, the NLU people have done it, even at the non-NLU level, or even at your individual level with friends, whether they be from NLUs or they are not, it is important to build uh, these kind of networks. You see, the, the moment we stop believing that we have to be competitive, the moment we stop believing that uh, you know I can only prosper if I if I grab the case myself and and I keep the other person out of it, the moment we start believing that actually there's space under the sun for everyone, the moment uh, that's the moment when you realize that there's actually a lot of opportunity to uh, to uh, to use your uh, uh, knowledge set. For example, what I'm saying is. But if you have a good diverse base and if, if you start building your networks, for example, let's say you practice uh, only in the high court and your friend is a person who practices, uh, let's say, in the district court or the city civil court or whatever, or, or if you that you practice only in the branch of, let's say, labor law or let's say um, property law and your friend uh, or your colleague is practicing in, 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 the, in the realm of criminal law. That's when you build this kind of, um, uh, you know, a kind of an informal or even formal kind of a network where you do this, this case assignment where you encourage that a person, a client comes to you, you send that client to, the, to your friend. And also your friend, when it is an area of your specialization, uh, uh, does that with you. Now, of course, this was, you know, let's not be naive. This already is happening. But what I'm saying is at one level, there is a need to institutionalize this. And the last thing, and then I'm done with my monologue and let's then, you know, open it up and let's have discussions. The last thing, and I feel, and this again, I'm addressing to, you know, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of supporters, a lot of well-wishers among the young lawyers. Uh, and I don't deserve uh, the love and affection that I get from so many of them. Uh, but I, I really feel that the voice of the young lawyers are not heard at all. So what we have in the bar associations, and this is not a case only of Delhi or Chandigarh, and I'm sure this is a case everywhere else, where you only have the select few, as it is, as it is, it is only those established lawyers who run for these elections, and it takes a lot of money, uh, a lot of muscle power, a lot of uh, resources to even, you know, try for these offices. And ultimately when these people gain control of these bar associations, there is obviously this whole thing of you scratch my back and I scratch my back with the bench. And it's normally status quo, which is what it veers towards that, you know, it's a little tinker here and there, but hardly the real issues of, of young people get, uh, get addressed. The real issues, for example, uh, I can, you, you know, name some of the elephants in the room, which people will not name, for example, giving of local commissions, uh, appointing as arbitrators for small matters, uh, you know, there has to be a way where you encourage a kind of a database or a kind of an application court wise, where the bar association cooperates with the respective high courts or district courts, and you set up a, a mechanism, a merit based open competitive exam uh, uh, mechanism whereby everyone who need not who need not be related or connected to a judge or a, or a senior lawyer uh, can be can have his or her name in this kind of data panel and there there is a system whereby everyone gets a chance to be appointed as a local commissioner or as an arbitrator or any kind of uh, you know assignment where lawyers get uh, 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 get opportunities young lawyers get 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 opportunities including of course legal aid and panels of legal aid also uh, 
you know, we have to at one level address the kind of um, uh, opening. Again, this is a big elephant in the room. Uh, the opening uh, uh, remuneration that is paid to young lawyers, and it is woefully pathetic. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, after uh, and especially now that law education is much more expensive than it earlier was, and we know how the uh, uh, the cost of living is like, for example, in Chandigarh, if you expect someone uh, uh, to hire a room, uh, even in Mohali or wherever, Pachkula or in, inside the UT, and have a mo bike, uh, a, bi a bike and, and commute from here and there and come to court, have a cell phone and a bike. I mean, just imagine the expenses of that. The rent, cell phone and bike is enough. And I don't know what the opening salaries are, but I am told it's in the range of 2025. Uh, that also in this day and age is becoming very, very um, less, especially we are, let's understand we are dealing with actually technically postgraduates because many of them are doing their graduation and then three years of law. And that's some something which really has to be addressed. Of course, the Bar Council recently said senior councils should take 15 people and all that, but that's again impractical and these are all political. Somewhere, some kind of mechanism has to be made out. The Bar Association can also in every state consider uh, having some kind of mechanism whereby they are the ones who will have, you know, like, you know, like you have an aggregator system for Uber, Uber, Ola, the, uh, uh, the taxis and airports. Well, why can't we use that kind of a same system whereby the Bar Association has a separate a, uh, a subcommittee which deals with the issues of young lawyers and uh, you, you know forms a system whereby these young lawyers who require placements a long time temporary short time permanent are able to be, be placed with the chambers of seniors and they are not left on their own to send applications here and there and the seniors also can notify their needs when I say senior, I don't mean designated seniors only. I mean people who are senior in the profession can also notify their needs like a clearing house for the Bar Association so that there is some openness uh, in this process. And we have to now open up. And I understand that in my heart breaks when every time we have to, uh, uh, you know, say no. I, I get so many applications from people all over the country uh, on a daily basis. And it breaks my heart to often say that, you know, I do not have the place to keep you or the infrastructure or the resources. But surely there can be some kind of system where it, this whole process becomes a little transparent and fair for these people. If we don't do that and if we just go on pursuing what we are doing, that is making money, doing our own case, doing our self promotions, I don't know how long we can sustain this system. This system, as it is, is at break point. Uh, and let me tell you, and this is something which gives me a lot of hope. The young lawyers today are much, much more courageous than we were or our previous generations were. And I don't have to tell you, there are so many legends of the Supreme Court who are venerated, who have been given national awards. But when it comes to actually speaking for the lawyers, speaking for justice, speaking for real issues, speaking against the uh, the uh, uh, the way the independence of the judiciary is subverted, they will keep silent because the status quo helps them because ultimately they have to get their practice and they have to go and get those uh, they have to get those orders. Those discretionary orders will come in their favor only if they keep quiet. And I feel at some place we have to reconcile this quietitude and the need to have a more democratic bar, need to have a bar which really is able to cater to the changing character of legal education and, and, and law graduates. At one level, the legal education is transformed. You have these NLUs, you have these students who are going into coaching and tutorial, even in class 10, 11, 12, for cracking the clack, spending lakhs on that, and then spending lakhs in legal education. And then many of them go abroad and get LLMs. And ultimately when they come back, you are telling them to inject themselves in that legal profession uh, where we are still fossilized and we are still playing the rules of let's say the previous century. And, I, and this is, I, I'm sorry to sound so negative because I'm, a, I'm normally a very optimistic person, but I feel that if the bar is unable to address this issue, we are going to see a break point in the future because you're going to have a lot of frustrated people 
Um, earlier, of course, with the economy doing very well, a, a lot of these people, not by some by choice, many by choice, but many by lack of um, alternatives, have got themselves absorbed in non-litigation activity. But as we see, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, there are uh, economic issues, there are, there's, a, there's a downturn which the nation is facing. Uh, you are going to have more and more people who are left with less and less options. So this is actually a wake up call. I don't know whether uh, uh, you know, we have been humorous or witty and it is a, a Saturday evening, but I thought uh, you know, we should also flag the serious things uh, um, when we are having this, uh, this conversation. Incidentally, uh, just to end on a, on a humorous note, when I wrote this book, I thought I was writing a very serious book and I was writing, you know, in the first wave, this was written in the, in March, April of 2020. And then of course it took its own time to come out. And when the publisher was pushing this as a humorous book and designed this very catchy, now, you know, now I think it's a very catchy cover. I, my first reaction was, oh God, I, I mean, I thought I wrote something very serious and uh, you seem to say it's very humorous. Uh, so, so this is where I just want to end by plugging in because I went totally off topic because, because you had told me to add in a little dash of humor or, the, or, or talk about the importance of humor in court. So I would say that, you know, it is very important. Two things are very important. Please, I, and I'm not plugging my book only here. Please uh, also read other stuff. Just don't go by law, law, law. You never know when that knowledge, that particular uh, that particular reading, and I know it's difficult for, for lawyers, especially young lawyers who are so busy doing their work to actually get time to read, but it's very important to have your knowledge base diverse because that's where you make a, a difference uh, in court. When you're able to make a cross-reference and say something which is not there in the in, in, in in what you uh, what you've just read in your formal legal books, number one, and number two, more importantly, often humor is a very very good way of making your point or 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 or, or getting a comeback in court. Which you know seriousness, we often take ourselves too seriously, but humor, and, and we have seen that the humor coming from the bench. Uh, and we have seen the humor coming. From, uh, so, for example, uh, when Hidayatullah was told uh, that, you know, I have a judgment, uh, the lawyer in the Supreme Court said, I have a judgment which lordships have given in, uh, sitting in Madhya Pradesh High Court. So lordships are bound by this judgment. Now, Hidayatullah could have been very angry and said, no, what nonsense, I will not be bound by this or, or be embarrassed. He just smiled and said, yes, counsel, yes, it's true that I wrote this judgment when I was in Madhya Pradesh High Court, but now I'm wiser. So humor always, uh, whether it be from the bench or whether it be from the bar, is a very, very good aid uh, in litigation. And uh, I would always recommend it. Um, let's not take ourselves so seriously as we do always. Thank you, Vikas. I think I've rambled on enough. If there are any questions, I'll be most happy to take them. We have allowed everyone, uh, whosoever, we will just ask them so that they may maintain some decorum, but they can, we have allowed everybody uh, can unmute himself and they can post the questions since normally we don't allow it in this session because what Sanjoy said, so we thought that again, coming back to his book, that if we lost that O to become O, we couldn't participate in that interactive session. So that O from O is the entire difference in the law. And Shekhar Kumar, though we have allowed him, but he says as a first generation lawyer, how to pick the right senior. Okay, now again on a serious note, nowadays, uh, in the, at the time of judicial appointments, uh, and it is very sad, uh, in many cases, the government is actually noticing which senior you worked with, and often judicial appointments are rejected, or judicial appointments are delayed, because the senior who you chose 25 years ago, when you were a young law student, just freshly graduated, see, who is not in the good books or not in the good list of the government of the day. And that gets a problem. So if you're interested in a judicial career, pick that senior who's least controversial. But again, they, you may not know in 25 years how controversial he or she may turn out to be. But otherwise, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it is very important. A senior is a mentor. And uh, it is very, very important that you don't look at a senior from the viewpoint, and this is what I said at the book release also, 
that you know unlike other seniors i to be very honest uh, i worked with ms indira jaising and i hardly have that way been encouraged by ms jaising in the sense that she is forwarded any case to me she is uh, encouraged uh, uh, anyone in of any uh, any company to put me in their panel etc it is true that many seniors do that some people who are blessed to be in um, good chambers the seniors promote them ensure that they are put in panels if the seniors are law officers then uh, they are also put in junior panels um, but let me tell you this very interesting story of um, uh, jinnah um, and uh, uh, mc chagla the chief justice of uh, of the bombay high court was jinnah's junior and he writes in his uh, in his book that a very uh, 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 lucrative case came to uh, jinnah and jinna was asked you name any junior from your chamber and i will uh, engage him and chagla was actually thinking that his senior mamad ali jinna would actually recommend him but he didn't and he says he was very angry then and he later realized that ultimately jinna was giving the ultimate lesson to him that you have to be self made so as i was saying in the book release what i what i learned from my senior and normally don't when you're choosing a senior don't see what i will get in terms of briefs in terms of opportunities of course that is also a relevant consideration but also consider what i will learn and to in in today's age we forget the learning aspect we are always looking at isme se kya contact milega kya network milega kya exposure milega think of what i will learn what values i will learn what exposure i will get not in the terms of clients but in the time in the, in the form of uh of the ecosystem of the senior because around the senior if for example uh, for example i can tell you if ms jaising had uh, uh, uh mr ravindra bhat justice ravindra bhat and justice mullidhar briefing him her and it is through working in her chamber that i got to know these two phenomenal judges and uh, you know i used to call them ravi and murli uh and they were okay with it in 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 those days i'm talking about 97 97 98 and that's how a lifelong association happened and i am so blessed to have been in the company and seen these two amazing judges you know develop uh, their judicial career and i would say that is only because i had the opportunity of working in in my seniors chamber you rightly said that you have to choose the office properly they say there are only three stages here learn and earn and they say that when you learn automatically you lose the l you just don't lose the o and it becomes the earn So this is uh, Pritam Patro in Supreme Court of India. Uh, how do you achieve your dream as becoming a first-generation lawyer in the right way? Well, you know what is your uh, your your takeaway or what you want? You know, I can tell you, Patro. Uh, with age, I'm an old man. So with age, your goals mellow. Um, at the end of the day when you are so rumi has this beautiful quote no rumi says that i am young and therefore i want to change the world and now i am old and therefore i want to change myself and there is some bit in that you know uh, as a first generation lawyer the issue is what is it you want to achieve uh, and everyone can't be everything everyone can't be the top but trust me if you work hard there is place for everyone now so so far as what is what is it you want to achieve depends on what is your ambition if your ambition is to provide for your family you will provide for your family if your ambition is to make tons of money then you have to work towards that goal but as a first generation lawyer there are there are positives and there are negatives what is a positive let's deal with the, everyone knows the negatives so let's deal with the positives the positive is that it's a clean slate you are not going to be judged by your grandfather father mother whoever is the person who is bringing you into the bar number 2 your career is independent of that person i agree um uh, you know even in chandigarh i know many people even maybe from my law school who had a lot of initial uh, impetus and and career growth only because they they came from established families of judges or lawyers and that is something we have to accept you see because the legal system has not grown beyond the way it is to accept a meritocratic system so therefore being a connected second generation lawyer or a or a son of a judge with uncle judges it has its advantages 
But the disadvantage also is that these are temporary. Of course, uh, if you are very competent and you have uh, you're a second generation with uncle judges and uncle lawyers, uh, you get that Philip and then you are sailing and you're cruising and you are there. But remember, if you don't, then you have a chance of, uh, of your career ending when that judge, judge retires. And we have seen that also. Everyone knows those kind of cases where you're heavily briefed, where your father is in the Supreme Court, father retires, and then you're gone. That kind of cases are also there. But as a first generation lawyer, it is up to you. You are writing the book. You are the author. You will fashion your career. You will fashion your destiny. And you ultimately, yes, the, the journey is difficult. The journey is longer. But ultimately, the pleasure of having achieved it on your own is immeasurable. This is, I'm an undergraduate in law. wanted to know careers and solicitorships in your words. Career in solicitorship. Now, see, solicitor concept is completely gone in places in, in, in North India. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming only two places where it's still thriving. I'm not very sure about Madras, but two places it's thriving are in Calcutta and in, uh, and in Bombay, the old charter courts. So uh, now, as a solicitor, of course, again, there are that, you know, technically, even in Britain, this happened. Solicitors, solicitors also want to argue. So even the standard, the the usual di distinction between a solicitor and lawyers are also breaking up. But uh, the career, if you are, if you find yourself that you want to be in the law, you know, in a law firm, as they say. So law firms also have the concept of minder, finder, grinder. Someone who finds, someone who minds, someone who grinds. So you have to, and 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 again, don't be harsh on yourself. Give yourself an opportunity of all roles. I started off my first one year was working in a consulting firm not doing a legal job at all. And then you realize this is not what you want to do. So as I said that, give yourself the time, give yourself all the exposure and then ultimately decide what you want to do. And at the same, and at the same time, uh, have it in your heart to be able to say that, okay, this is not what I want to do. And I'm okay. I, okay. I went up the wrong path. Let me now do the right path. So if you are looking to establish a law firm, if you are looking more of a Council of a practice where you don't want to be an arguing counsel or a senior advocate, then a solicitorship is what you should look at. And the cities which you are looking at mostly are, are Delhi and uh, uh, sorry, uh, are Bombay and, and Calcutta. But otherwise, of course, in, Del uh, in Delhi and other places also, there are law firms which are, though they're not technically called solicitors, but they are doing solicitor practice in as much as they're briefing counsels. So, so, so that's also something you have to keep in mind if you are passionate about arguing cases in court, etc. You might find this not to your suiting, not to your liking, because ultimately you will be doing the hard work, and there'll be some other lawyer who will be coming and arguing and getting all the kudos in court. Say so that the difference is just like in director and an actor. Solicitor <laughs> becomes the director, and the actor gets the all the accolades. Yeah, but unless you can be Karan Johar, then everyone remembers the the, the director as well. <laughs> the effect of the social media. Yes. Uh, and he says, uh, could you please tell the book that had an impact on your life as a lawyer? The book that had an impact on life? On, on, see, uh, see, if people who are in Delhi High Court know me, uh, you know, I'm not so technology, technology friendly. So though I have a Kindle, I, you, I prefer using the, like I, while waiting for this case, I was reading this book. So uh, even in court, I always carried a book. And I can proudly say that it became a trend. Many lawyers also started carrying a book. Because a lot of time we end up wasting, uh, uh, you know, you, you know that's why the pandemic was so great because we were we were able to wa minimize wastage of time, which which happens in physical court. So I would always carry a book with me, and I still do. I carry a I carry a book and I read a book. I have read various kinds of uh, fiction, nonfiction, uh, graphic novels are, are something which I like. I, I'm very interested in the genocide, uh, which is the killing of the Jews uh, by the Nazi Germany. So uh, a graphic novel called Maus, Maus means mouse in German, Maus by R. Spiegelman is something which really uh, changed my life. The graphic novels of Osamu Tezuka, brilliant graphic novels by, uh, by this Japanese uh, creator of manga comics is also something which I liked. Uh, the Princely Imposter uh, is a book which I earlier also spoke about in another interview. 
which also is an amazing book on the trial of Bhaval Sanyasi's case, which is the, as you know, which is which was the which was the longest civil trial and the most enigmatic trial where you dealt with this question of identity, the whole concept of hearsay evidence. The trial of Oscar Wilde also, if you can get, please read the trial of Oscar Wilde, the transcript of the trial, you, you, it'll, it's, it's amazing. Then uh, uh, the book on Ram Jitpalani, uh, uh, the rebel, the Nani Palkiwala's courtroom genius, Fali Nariman's books are, are you know, they are quite, uh, you know, they go here and there for me, they don't work for me. And even the son's books are too voluminous for me. I have not even tried to read them. But uh, Nani Palkiwala, Granville Austin's working of a democratic constitution, something again, I loved reading Granville Austin. I love reading Gobinda Dash on the identity of the Supreme Court. Um, it is amazing uh, uh, the, ki the kind of work that was done. And it's not done today because today, uh, since 1980s, hardly there is Abhinav Chandra Chur's book on the Bombay High Court is also very good. He's a very uh, young and upcoming lawyer and writes very well. So you wanted one book, I've given you so many books. <laughs> it is a typical, as they say, a lawyer, it's my brief and it runs into hundreds of pages. <laughs> and once you were talking of uh, Mr. Justice Chagla, Roses in December, I, I thought you would be speaking about that. Yes, Roses in December. But let yep. me tell you, a judge from your high court, neither Roses nor Thorn, was very disappointing. So if you are reading H.R. Khanna's book, it's, uh, it is not written in good prose, though, of course, he writes from the heart. But yeah, it's mandatory reading. Uh, uh, if you should read his book, but it's not literature wise, it's not a good book. I'm reminded of Shakespeare. Some people have liked it. It says nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so your taste makes it so. <laughs> no one can beat you at repartee, Vikas. Nothing. It says Aman Kapoor, as a junior in a senior council chamber, often we see the machine and work as a wonderful argument delivered with just some hours of preparation. How can you a junior learn to grab skills, especially arguing skills in a senior chamber? Okay, this is what I keep telling my juniors and often they disappoint me. Often they, most often they don't, but when they disappoint me, I tell them this. I got my first opportunity to argue almost four years into my senior's chamber. For four years, I did not open my mouth in court. So this is very important for everyone to learn this, this itch itchiness to, to be able to be heard, to, to, get an, uh, to get an order, to, to then post it on social media, to have bar and bench report it. As a junior in a senior's chamber, the most important thing that you learn is that you are arguing before the senior who's the judge. So that is your trial. Prepare the, uh, prepare the case as if you are the arguing counsel. Do your research, do your one page uh, summary, get your, uh, get your case law, do everything, uh, do everything the, the, that you have to do. And then brief your senior as if you're briefing a judge. So that is your trial, that is your preparation. And ultimately, often, and this would happen to especially people who have lady, uh, lady seniors like I had will realize often you end up saying ma'am because it's, it's unconscious because you, when you're briefing, you're always saying ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. And then when you're appearing for a male judge, often it come out, you'll say ma'am. And then you realize that no. So as a junior, focus on, on your senior. Your senior is the court for you. That is your training ground for you. So they say the grind lies in that. And you're saying that for four years you didn't do the practice. I'm reminded of the Chinese saying that the bamboo trees don't shoot up for many years. And ultimately, when they shoot up, they shoot up beyond all, all the other trees. So they say that the uh, if the foundation is strong, the superstructure will automatically be strong. So that's the key what Joy says. And uh, one uh, Hamza says, would you recommend one, one practice sufficiently in the lower court, high court, and then progress to Supreme Court? Or should one direct join High Court or Supreme Court Council Chamber directly? Okay, so in in the book, I bring in a quote from what actually happened in our real life, where a professor asks, so what law will you practice? And everyone said, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do this. And ultimately, the professor said, you are fools. You will practice where your clients take you. 
So that having been said, I would always recommend, and now of course my recommendation is again impractical because everyone can't do what I'm going to tell you. I was lucky enough to be able to do it. I will always recommend a stint in the Supreme Court for one or two years before you go and start back from the trial court or start away from uh, start right away from the trial court or the high court. If you can do it, try it, because once you are in the Supreme Court and you have the ability as an appellate lawyer to grasp a brief, and maybe because I started off as an appellate court lawyer, I, re I realized that I feel that way, maybe I'm wrong. But it always grounds you because you realize that even when you're drafting that legal notice, you are drafting ultimately thinking that appellate lawyer sitting in the Supreme Court having to find some point from that legal notice on how the Supreme Court will ultimately see this case 20 years from now when it reaches the Supreme Court. So it always gives you that overall perspective that this is how it will be. So, so that one or two years in the apex court uh, uh, grounds you or gives you that, equips you for this. But that having been said, I'm conscious that everyone can't rush to the Supreme Court. So whatever you do, whatever trial, you start with the trial court, you start with the high court, wherever you start, my advice will be that, as I said, I'm, I'm now repeating, give it sufficient time, number one. And number two, don't confine your knowledge to only that particular court. You must read about what is happening. If you're a high court lawyer, read about what is happening. And nowadays with technology, with bar, band, bar and bench, live law, leaflet and all, you have live tweeting. Everyone knows what's happening in the trial court in all these cases. Follow everything, follow procedures. I always feel that people who've practiced in the trial court are so grounded in civil and criminal procedure, which is missing amongst us lawyers who actually did not have the opportunity to start from the trial court. So this is a, this is a difficult one. This is a choice which you have to take depending on the kind of opportunities that you're getting. So if you're getting an opportunity to work with a very, very fantastic top class senior straight away out of law school, then I would say, take it, go to the Supreme Court. But if you're getting an opportunity of hands-on working in the trial court, at times that may be better because uh, that really gives you an opportunity of hands-on training, which if you are one of the 10 juniors of a top class senior sitting in the Supreme Court, that may not give you that opportunity. Uh, nicely put across that once you practice on the top, you know how to structure your arguments. But at the same time, when you talked about the legal notice, if you practice in trial court, you also show that you have to be more like an astronomer, the man who saw tomorrow. And before I uh, we conclude for the session, the man who was the bridge between me and Joy and all this group, Navdeep had joined though he was in uh, Roorkee. But as I said, hi Navdeep. Uh, good evening. I I requested Mr. Chatrath to arrange a topic, you know, something like uh, the impact of rock music um, on, on law. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and he assured talk, me. Let's, he, let's... He, he assured me that that would be it. But I mean, I, I, I saw the poster insights into the world of litigation, but I'm happy I joined still. And... Uh, <laughs> So, so nice to have you here, and and uh, I, I hope Mr. Chatrath brings you more often um, to Chandigarh virtually, uh, if not physically. And uh, it was also very nice to hear hear you, uh, you know, talk to youngsters uh, on the fact that I mean, kind of saying that don't look for publicity or your or your um, uh, you know judgments all over the social media. I find this is a very um, I won't say disturbing, but this is a very funny trend because in in our profession. The only word that matters is the word of mouth. And uh, you cannot go around flouting your judgments or the orders you have, uh, um, I mean, argued in court and uh, and advertising yourself, which is uh, as it is not allowed in this profession. And I really liked it when you, when you, uh, you know, told all of them that uh, don't look for such publicity. And uh, there's, there's only one way of doing that, hard work. I mean, whether you're first generation, second generation, third generation, doesn't matter. If you're a hard worker, you're bound to succeed. And success would come only through word of mouth and your uh, ethics and your, your practices and uh, not uh, through social media or, or publicity. And um, once again, thanks a lot for coming over uh, uh, to Beyond Law CLC. And uh, uh, I mean, Mr. Chitrath, uh, also I'm, I'm really grateful for you, I mean, to, to you for organizing this and hope to see you more often here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Navdeep.
So, like uh, we can end up the session by saying that if you are the will and willing to drill and the drill, then as I say that karlo dunia muthi mein, and you can always do well. And we will conclude what we started at the first instance. The profession is more like a bottle of perfume. The moment you open the bottle, your knowledge spreads and people start engaging you. Thank you, Sunjoy, and thank you, Navdeep, for connecting with us and sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Everyone thank stay you connected. Me. Thank you. Have a great weekend, all of you, and thank you all for joining. Thank you. And tomorrow we have a session on the part two of Justice KT Sankran on the amendments of the Code of Civil Procedure. Do stay connected with us tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay blessed, and keep on learning from people like Sunjoy. Thank you. Namaskar. Jai.